Hey, good morning, and uh, welcome to Korean Natural Farming Office Hours, and uh, here for November 6th, 2022. Welcome to November, it's a good one, and good to see folks checking in from around the world. It's a great growing good community, making Master Cho proud, and always good to see you guys, good friends here. So, let's see. Today, though, today, the I Ching is not always the best. And today is number six. It's conflict. And it says the proper, the proper response to conflict, whether it lies within or without us, is disengagement. So whenever we allow ourselves to be drawn off balance, away from the strength of of quiet integrity, we are in conflict. It matters not whether the confrontation is between competing values in one's own mind or with another person. It is the inner departure from clarity and equanimity that leaves us with feelings of despair and vulnerability. The only remedy is to disengage from the problem and return to the quiet contemplation of what is correct. Conflict provokes strong feelings of doubt, fear, anxiety, and an impatience to resolve the situation. If you act under the influences of these inferior emotions, you will severely complicate the misfortune. By following the prescription of the sage, by returning to a position of neutrality, acceptance, and detachment, you're able to meet opposing forces halfway, not recoiling in anger or condemnation, not pressing forward for some unnatural change in things, but waiting calmly in the center for the higher power to provide the correct solution. The I Ching teaches us that all conflict is in the end inner conflict. When you see it beginning, you are not obliged to pursue it, for this only compounds your own misfortune. If you cannot regain your equanimity on your own, then seek the assistance of a just and impartial person in resolving the difficulty. The only way to live free of conflict is to hold steadfast the proper principles in all things. Through balance, patience, and devotion to inner truth, we rise above every challenge. Whew, yeah, that's a good one. Good way to start the day, remembering that yeah, the only way to get through conflict is to disengage and get back to what's the core balance, equanimity, all those things. And if we have conflict that we can't resolve, appeal to somebody that does know the answers. So listening to Master Cho, you know, not just me, but like him and all of our things and, you know, God and the greatness, you know, Master Cho would always talk about how God is um, his ultimate inspiration, the 4-H himself, you know, um, God, the Bible, these great uh, masters, these great wisdom, you know, that's where he drew his inspiration. And he lived through the Korean War, which was crazy. Um, they basically killed every single tree in the country, defo defoliated the entire country in the, I think it was the 50s, right? So anyway, good to, good to see you guys from around the world. We got Arkansas in the house. We got Idaho. We got... Uh, Mark up in South, Southern Oregon, Belgium. Oh my gosh, good evening. Um, Western Australia, Long Island, New York. <laughs> um, yeah, Washington State, Virginia. Um, working towards a degree in horticulture up in Virginia to bring the knowledge I've gained in natural farming that's cool. And, um, which by the way, I was working on this, um, the other day, uh, cause I had, 
had some interesting things happen where I was last time I was talking about host Papa going out and um, let's see here. Let me bring this over here. Hang on one sec. Yeah. Okay. And then hit that. And so basically I actually, let me go, let me slide this sucker over. Hang on one sec. It looks, and then bring it up this way, this one. Yeah, transition that over. Okay, so this one I put up, uh, you know, these, these things sponsored by Pure Canna Foundation, and I had to re-put our website up, so I figured why not redo it and make it look a little nicer. And so um, put up the Pure Canna Foundation. If you want to make a tax-deductible donation, you can click right here. It'll take you to our Secure Stripe, um, where you can make a donation to the foundation, help help out the Pure Canna Foundation, and um, also, right now, we are doing a contest. We're sponsoring two tickets to the HFUU convention, state convention, as I mentioned last week. And um, so you can enter to win here. And if you click on the contest details and see those, basically, there are two contests that we're running to go. Uh, a luck category, which means you just send an email to contest at purknf.org or the merit category, which is where you write a small little um, little entry, 500 characters or less, answering how has Korean natural farming in influenced your approach to regenerative agriculture. And so far, I've gotten a bunch of entries in the luck category, but not a single entry in the merit category. So if you're, fe if you're in Hawaii, you want to attend the HFU convention where I'll be teaching two courses on natural farming. One is on um, KNF and human health. So we're going to make a bunch of fermented plant juices together and, or not make a bunch, but take ones that are made and mix, make mixed drinks and show people how they can take these tasty things that you've made and make a delicious farm treat to keep you the most important tool going. And the second one is going to be um, IMO for soil optimization. And that is using the indigenous microbes and all the natural farming solutions to um, optimize your soil. So if you're in Hawaii or you want to fly to Maui, you know, and you want a free ticket to the HFU convention, enter here, contest at purknf.org. And um, then you'll get a free ticket there. And then there's, you know, some terms and conditions talking about how it works and all that. So, um, but anyway... Looking forward to that. Thanks to the Pure KNF Foundation doing good stuff. And one of the main reasons I went to talk about this right now is someone was studying for horticulture in Virginia. So if you go up here and you click on the research up here, research tab, um, there's all these papers by the University of Hawaii. So if you're wanting to share something with your professors, your people that are in academia, um, these are all peer-reviewed by the College of Tropical Ag and Human Resources of the University of Hawaii. And these are all these papers. And if you look at them, uh, for instance, like check out uh, the Oriental Herbal Nutrient one, you'll see that yours truly is an author on these papers and that um, did contribute some to this and um, really written by Mike DuPont, though. Uh, the uh, godfathers of natural farming. But all these are the solutions in a peer-reviewed college header thing. So if you're wanting to get these like into your system, you can then introduce your professors this way. And it's not just like some magic stuff you learned on the internet. It's actually peer-reviewed from a university. So all those are available at purekf.org slash research. And, um, take you to this page where you can get all those. So um, anyway, just wanted to share that with you. And what's up, uh, Tyler in Oklahoma. And uh, let's see, go back to this guy here. And yeah, so um, Bel yeah, Belgium, West Virginia, so let's see here. Louisiana, yeah, get some. Clean up the mouth of the Mississippi, man. We need it. Heard that thing's going dry because of the terrible soil practices. 
Um, yeah, conflict is inevitable. It's about changing minds without the use of violence. Yes, exactly. Um, balance and equanimity. Same, same in natural farming. You know, it's a conflict-free farming method where you're bringing balance versus trying to juice the plant and come into conflict. Instead, you're trying to restore equanimity, restore peace, restore the soil, restore all these great things. So it's really a non-conflict type of farming. Um, oh, and you're in Oregon. Okay. Oregon State. OSU in the house. It's the, the beavers, right? Yeah, beavers, beavers. My sister was a, a duck. That's how I know that. Um, so, yeah, and um, Tanzania. What's up? Oh, man, it's a worldwide community. Um, so, um, okay. Um, so, uh, the Busby is kind of starting to ask a question here or more like tell a little story here and, um, so the Busby is saying, uh, I recently took, uh, on a new project that has some existing six-year-old fig trees. Um, currently a lot of the leaves have rust spots on them. Um, but I am noticing there is these black spots on the leaves. Um, so probably that's a fungal or bacterial thing starting to grow on there. Rust, rust is, I believe, a fungus. I think it's a fungus. Um, so in these black spots on the leaves and the trunks, can I use KNF to save these trees? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, um, the way to do it, way to do it, there's, there's a couple ways. Okay. One, one, one way is kind of more conventional approach here. And it would be to do like the Jadam type of thing where, um, you mix a, a sulfur and, um, he actually has some, if you search here, um, yeah, let me just search this up. Uh, Jadam rust. Um, and oh and it's you can't really find this here so it's not um but basically he in his book his jadam book he talks about um using those tools like sulfur and um a few other gnarly things but so there is you can go and attack it but this is about conflict it's about bringing balance and you're in conflict so you don't really want to imbalance these things so um, using, um, the, getting the IMOs on the leaves. So making a liquid IMO. So take your IMO from the forest, get it, um, either use your seed IMO, which is just the IMO you gathered mixed with sugar and make that into a tea or go through the process of actually bulking it up to make a propagated IMO where you bulk it out in, um, a substrate feeding it nutrients and then, Activate it by adding soil in and going through to make what Master Cho would call IMO4, which is just activated IMO with your soil. So it's been you got the seed and you propagated it, then you activate it with your soil and make that into a tea and then spray it up on the leaves. And that's going to be a great solution because you will, like I was talking last week on this, um, heavily about this, um, Last week's presentation was great. Um, I'll go over to this one here and actually set it up with this. Uh, this one. And here was talking about soil and environment recovery. And A, getting the soil better, um, but also using the leaves to make your leaves a bit stronger. And right towards the end of this presentation right here, he was talking about microbes of a healthy leaf. And you see this fungus, you see these bacterias all on the leaf surface. And if you have a disease leaf, you have it where there's not a bunch of microbes on there. And they're leaving those spaces open for those the rust and the black spot to form. And so the key is to get enough microbes up there and get them into their spot. Um, another quick, easy way to do it uh, besides making the IMO is to go with the KNF protectors. So th those are the, your lactic acid bacterias 
and um, those are here. I think it's still showing. Yeah, okay. And then um, going down to the lactic acid bacteria. So this is in my recipe book at knfsupport.com. And go to this recipe here where you make the KNF protectors. And then dilute this 1 to 1,000 and spray that on your leaf surface. And these microbes, these will grow and protect your leaves and get rid of those kinds of disease. Um, but the disease can also be somewhat nutritionally um, dependent. Like if you're if your things are hungry and you're, you know, like think of think of people that are like, you know, hungry and cracked out. They got all kinds of disease on them. So not only putting good microbes protecting it, but also in the book here, going up to the nutrient formulas where you take all the all these different nine solutions, which the protectors are part of that right here, and the microbes though what I was talking about, the IMO and the protectors, and then mixing those up in a uh, leaf solution here um, where you're going to mix this solution. So all these together and then spraying it on your figs um, will also provide the nutrition. So it's a, it's a combo of getting the right microbes in your leaf surface, but then also feeding your plant and feeding it foliarly. It'll take this right in and help, uh, especially uh, the structure here. This one to a thousand structure really helps to harden off the leaf surface and get it to be great. And then alternating uh, between the leaf solution and this fruit solution here. Um, if you look at the this page here, it kind of talks about how it goes through a chubby and skinny phase as your plant is growing and that you alternate these solutions that you're using. So if you get the book, you'll see, understand, no. And um, as you know, hang out at the office hour, check it out. Lots of good people in the chat talking about all kinds of good things. Uh, but those are the basic ideas of get good microbes on your leaf surface, provide your plant enough nutrition, and then get the soil really well. So if you're curious about that, I talked about it a lot in detail last week going over that presentation. And it's at the end of last week's office hour, which I think was October 30th or something. So, um, yeah, so that's how you'd use KNF. And then also, um, Mark, who's arm bruster, Rock Martin is talking about, um, putting OHN on there, I think. Um, and OHN also helps to get rid of those types of things. Okay. So, and that's, that's in your, your leaf solution here. It's, it's in there already. That's why it, it works. And that's why it's basically like, hey, th these things work. Um, so anyhow, um, so James Carocola I is saying um, he used the KNF structure on his vanilla farm and got rid of, got a lot of flowers, not got rid of them, got a lot of them. Um, please advise what is the next nutrient to use for enlarging them and when. So, um, to get large vanilla beans, man, you are, you know, it's, it's all about conflict, not getting into conflict. It's all about creating this balance here. And, um, so James, after they've, you've gotten good flower, A, you got to pollinate them. So most likely you got to go out and hand pollinate those flowers. Um, just saying, you know, you need to pollinate them. Otherwise you're not going to get beans. Um, there is some animals that do it, I think flies or something that, that pollinate the vanilla. I'm not exactly sure, but I remember as a kid, I would go out at night and you have to do it at night for some reason. I think maybe that's when the blossoms open and I'd tap the flowers, get the pollen in a little film canister and then take a paintbrush and go out there. And I remember, I don't, when I, like I said, I was a little kid doing this. So, um, but I remember taking the paintbrush and then sticking it up in the, you know, kind of artificially inseminating these flowers with the pollen. So, um, and I remember we kept that pollen in the fridge. So, A, you got to pollinate. If you didn't pollinate, you're not going to get beans, even though you got a great flower set. It's going to be just the natural pollination just isn't nearly as good as the great pollination. And I think that's why bees don't do it because it's at night. I'm pretty sure something like this, and then you got to pollinate. So, 
hopefully you've pollinated um, to getting great good beans. Um, the the key then is that you would be so you you're in this nutrient cycle here. Um, let's see if I can. I, oh shoot, I scrolled away. Um, let's see here. So I was actually trying to make this a little bit bigger here. And slide this over. And um, so you pass the puberty phase. You're now into the blooming phase when the flowers bloom. And then you want to get into this pregnancy and ripening phase. Um, it's very similar to a human if you can think of it. But you're going to enter a chubby, skinny, chubby, skinny. And right in here, it's mostly that you're going to apply fruit formula. And how to use this guide, there's a whole video on it of how to time this out with your crop and how to make it all synchronize. And that's why I also teach classes, which by the way, are coming up, have classes here, um, canfarm.com. I have classes coming up here at the farm that you can be a part of and get in on it. Um, January 6th through the 12th. And I only have one more, um, ticket or pass uh, opportunity to stay at the farm. So you still can come to Big Island, stay somewhere else and get in on it. But if you want to stay at the farm, there's only one more left. So if you're thinking about it and you're on the fence, hey man, now's the time. But you can learn all about this charts and how to grow great big vanilla beans, great flowers, great fruits, great whatever you're wanting to grow because we go through it and you get a like a seven day immersion understanding more KNF than you can handle. So bring a notebook or a video recorded or something so you can remember what we go over because that's what we do. Um, so I also teach people in person how to do this. Uh, just saying. Um, and let's see what else here. May as well pump my own stuff, right? It's my own show. I was looking up how to monetize YouTube and it's like, sell your own stuff. It's like, oh, really? There's no way to really make money on YouTube because people, you know, although I do appreciate the super chats when they come through, um, you know, and if I answered your question, it saved you a bunch of money. Hey, think of that or donate to the foundation or donate directly to me at naturalfarminghawaii.net slash donate. However, it doesn't matter. I'm also doing great things. I mean, to say it doesn't matter is not, I don't want to undervalue any contribution I have, but I'm not doing this just for the contributions is what I mean when I say it doesn't matter. It really does matter. You're, you're, all that really matters. <laughs> it really matters. Um, so anyway, not to demean that and get off subject and get off topic. Um, but Cecily is saying she takes the OH and OHM. See, this is why the acronyms are weird. The KNF medicine every day for post-nasal drip, no coughing for two years. See, and that's why at the HFU convention, we are going to talk about Korean natural farming for human health, because it's stuff like this where people may have nasal drip or allergies or all these things, and they could be tuning in to Korean natural farming. The same thing they're going to put on their plants, they could dilute and make for themselves with some ice cold water or warm water, depending on how you roll and healing yourself because you're your number one tool. You're the sky crane of your farm. <laughs> um, and we finally got the for at my house a few weeks ago. OHN was definitely part of our treatment plan. Yes. Yes. And um, yeah, so it helps me recover. Um, however, uh, just, you know, when I got, when I got the Rona, I had also simultaneously a kidney infection. I'm not sure which one caused the other, but oh man, my kidneys were on fire and chlorine dioxide. Oh my gosh. It, it fixed everything. I, I, within a half hour, my, for 15 minutes, my kidneys were back down. My fever went down. Um, didn't, I didn't feel like I was dying. Um, chlorine dioxide. It's awesome. Not going to lie. Um, you know, people, people hate on it, whatever, but 
I can tell you the proof's in the pudding at work for me. Told my friend who's a um, physician's assistant. And he was like, yeah, but that stuff can kill you other ways. And sorry, sorry to make your voice sound like that when I'm talking. He's actually a really good, respectable friend of mine, but he is skeptical as heck on it. And the only thing it did was make my nose slightly um, dry, like not, not the inside, but the outside a little flaky. So obviously it does have some side effects of like flaking you out, but could have been that I was also extremely dehydrated from the whole process and everything. But um, hey, put that in your medicine cabinet, look it up, chlorine dioxide. I'm making no medical claims here, but it worked for me. Um, so yeah, donations make it possible. So with that, got through all the questions here. It's great. Um, love you guys reaching out. Not going to end it here. In fact, I'm going to transition over to the presentation that I was going through and continuing to go through. So if you have more questions, drop them in the chat. Um, I did find out that the chat um, goes away. So it's not always there. So if you want to watch the chat, you got to watch it within the first 48 hours or so. Apparently the chat goes away. I got to sneeze. Hang on. Oh. Hey, God bless you. Yeah. Hey, 80 year old typing, man, 80 year old farming. That is, that's amazing. I, I really, I really appreciate it. And, you know, it's amazing to see. One of the things that trips me out is that KNF is multi-generational. It's not just um, these where it's like, you know, the average age farmer is something like 60 plus in America. I think it's globally probably too. Um, salute. Um, but the, um, you know, so 80, you're actually not that old of a farmer. Um, and you know, that's, that's an, another alarming factor is that, um, you know, we're, we're old. So anyway, I'm just gonna go, uh, get into this presentation, quickly go through this review of last week and then, uh, get on to the new bits. So Master Cho talking about soil environment recovery or how to make your soil come back to life is a better way of saying it. And he talks about this whole system, how the microbes are involved and how it naturally defends itself. And this uh, talks about, you know, here's a pathogen, say this is the black mold or the rust coming. And then if you got good microbes, they will defend your leaves. And then as your, as your plant reaches out for more nutrients, it gets more ability to heal itself. And we talked about how using IMO, seawater, and grass is a great formula. And there was a question, um, forget exactly who, I think, I think it was my buddy in Paris or France that was asking about this. Um, and he was saying, well, cut grass? No, Master Cho's about talking about living grass, like letting the grass grow tall in your orchard or wherever you're growing between your crops, wherever to get it going. Um, and then you get this great soil where there's air space inside and the roots can reach out and the fungus can pull nutrients as it balls things together and then extracts things out. And a living soil is like this. And then, but if you're working with dead soil, there's no way for the fungus to reach out and grab nutrients. There's no aggregation. There's no air space. There's no water penetration. All of these things, right? Talked about this last week. And then here's where, where you have good soil the roots can reach out super far. Whereas if it's dead, it's like there's excess nutrients that shouldn't be there. They're not in the right place. There's bad nematodes. There's poor aggregation. There's roots only reach out a very small way. And so this is no wonder there's disease above because there's, there's dis-ease below, right? So expansion. So get your good rhizosphere, get, you know, grow tall grass where the roots will be penetrating in, put seawater to chemically flocculate your soil and put IMOs to bring it to life, right? And then here's a picture of the IMOs that he's collecting. You know, look at all that mycelium. This is obviously under a bamboo, great place to gather because bamboos put out more sugars in their roots, um, naturally aggregate more IMOs. Um, here's another couple pictures. And then if you see, if you dig down under the IMOs, you're seeing all this great aggregated soil, just like the picture. And this is where you're going to want to put your collection box right down on the good aggregated soil. Cause these aren't, these microbes, even though they look good, are not necessarily the microbes you're after. You're after these microbes that are in this soil area, which I don't know if you guys can see my mouse. I'm going to, um, hang on one sec. I'm going to make it just a little bit bigger for you. 
And this other day, someone was talking about how the mouse isn't that big. Let me see here. Pointer size. Let's make it extremely large. There you go. And so there you can see. So these are the microbes you're after. These ones in the soil. Not necessarily these. These are on the surface showing you there's good microbes below, but these are them. Oh, and super chat. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. It's a good encouragement for other people to do super chat as, as well, because those are always fun, right? So, um, so looking at the, here's a great IMO collection again, low hollow basket, just like we advocate in Hawaii. And those are, it's down deep enough to get the microbes. It's not just in this top leaf litter, it's down below. And then of course you can take these same microbes from the soil and put them on the um, plant leaf surface so that you get rid of this, like I was talking about earlier. So, and, um, you know, make more photosynthesis. And then, you know, as I talked last time, paper beats rock, right? And also it beats scissors. Well, no, or rock beats scissors. So don't try to crack through the rock with tools and try to chip the rock or try to smash it or try to open your soil. Instead, use paper to defeat rock, right? So trees going through rocks, right? That's a classic, you know, rock, paper, scissors type of thing. Uh, you know, rock beats scissors, but paper beats rock, right? So use that analogy there and use trees to penetrate and break it, break everything apart. So, so that's a little review from last week. If you like that, go check out the previous office hours and the previous office hours are at knfsupport.com. And again, the previous office hours are here and you can go up to office hours and you can find and look, and it looks like actually last week's one isn't there, but it'll be there after today's episode when I put it up. Because not only do I work for an office hour, I also work afterward to do all the background behind the scenes things to make sure that these websites stay current. And there's also other folks in the Peer KNF Foundation that do a lot of work behind the scenes as well. That if I gotta go back three episodes, because it looks like they're a bit behind, but here back at the August 28th one, and maybe it's just because I haven't uploaded them yet, but there are table of contents here. So if you're like, what did he talk about this office hour? If you go back a few episodes, you will find these. And if you are interested in doing table of contents and doing it in a timely fashion so that we can have it that week done, we have uh, actually monetary reward for doing it. So get in touch with me, drake at purknf.org. And if you're interested in making these table of contents, I would love it because right now it's two folks that are doing it and they're, they're great. I really appreciate it. It's happening. They're doing it. But I also want it to happen timely. Like it'd be great if it was done right now as we're doing it real time, you'd have these, ta these table of contents. Cause then it's like, now I can look back and see exactly what's happening. But if you go back to any of the older ep episodes, you'll find they all have table of contents here under them. So you can find, you know, foaming lacto, if that's a problem with you, how's master Cho doing, you know, you can find out all these questions and more about eating insects is not a solution. And all these have past um, table of contents. And if you're thinking to yourself, wow, that's great, but I don't want to go to each episode. Well, then you can search here and you can search for insects. And all of a sudden now it'll show you every episode that contains the word insects in it, right? And apparently there's only two. But now you can search the office hours. So isn't that great as well? So um, anyway, let you know that's how to go back to the older episodes. Find them, canfsupport.com. Look under office hours, you'll find it. Um, but let us, let us not digress too far and let us get into today's bit of this, which is continuing Master Cho's presentation on indigenous microorganisms, also known as IMO. And this is by Master Cho's old organization, uh, before it was hijacked by other folks. Um, so what is the indigenous microorganisms? Um, well, you can read this Kringlish here. In a variety 
of soil microorganisms. So it means that basically what he's going for is extreme diversity in a variety. It means that it's not just one microbe. Like oftentimes when academia studies IMOs, it'll break it down to say, well, it's Bacillus subtilis primarily, or it's, um, uh, by, I don't know, there's, there's, a, there's two microbes that are really predominant in there, and they'll say, oh, it's these. If you have these, these are IMOs. And it's like, well, it's actually a bunch of subtle, diverse microbes that you're able to capture through this process and then propagate up to extremely large quantity and volumes. And in the propagation process, you're also getting more diversity happening. And you're also getting indigenous ones that are tuned to your zone. So it's you're getting a huge variety and diversity. So in a variety of soil microbes, that's what they're talking about. Very subtle, small ones in there with tons and tons and tons of diversity. And it says their own ability and strength to live and find out alive. Again, Kringlish, right? That's why I'm going through this presentation, breaking it down in solid English. And it means that they are well adapted to your zone, right? What is the strongest microbe in an area? It's the one from that area. If I bring in a foreign microbe, like, like a great analogy for this is to take somebody who's from a northern climate and bring them down to a southern climate. All of a sudden, they're like sweating too much. They're too hot. Um, they're getting sunburn. Uh, you know, they, they're getting disease. They get like hookworm and they get like all kinds of disease and all that kind of stuff. And, and you're not very well adapted. So the local people are out there working all day. And the person from the northern climate's like, oh, it's too hot. I got to go, you know, and they get sunburned. And they're like, oh, and they got to have all these other like tools to help them. And take the juxtaposition on it. Take someone from a southern climate, bring them to a northern climate. And they're like freezing to death. They don't know how to chop wood and make a fire to stay warm in winter. They, they just... They're used to just like, you know, sleeping outside. All of a sudden it's like cold. They forget to bring a sweater when they go in a building during the day because they come out in the night and it's cold and they freeze. They don't know how to drive in the snow. They crash their car. They they lock up their brakes. You know, think of all this. Like if you can think of it on a human level, you can think of it on the microbial level, except for, you know, for us, we move many miles for microbes, even moving a mile is a fair amount of distance for them because they're so tiny, right? You take that same, same tininess and multiply a mile and it's like, whoa, they've moved thousands of times their body length, right? Whereas a human, it's like, okay, we've, you know, we've gone pretty far, but, you know, it's that adaptability, it's that climate. And also taking, you know, from one side of the island to the other, which is less than 100 miles, but it's also extremely different climactically, right? So thinking about the ones that are right there, are your strongest ones. They have the best ability. They know how to use the local resources. And um, the environment and ability to cope. So so this next, this next point here, environment, ability to cope, is they're already used to working your soil, right? Like, like if I get a microbe that's from a lab or somewhere else and I try and bring it in, it's not going to know how to best deal with that soil, these water conditions, these climates, these things, it, it, it just doesn't know, you know, so, so the native ones that they're already, you know, using those local resources, they already know where to go, where the water is, where the resources, where the nutrients are. Hey, yo, super chats, super chats are great. I, 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 I really do appreciate those. They really do help me. And I am, cause I'm building all kinds of stuff in the, uh, on the farm and things ain't cheap, man. I tell you, taking this hour to do this, it's great to nourish the community, but it's also great to get nourished a little bit back. So appreciate it. Thank you, uh, the buzz. Um, and the soil environment, you know, like they build the best soil environment, right? Your indigenous microbes. It's not like bringing in foreign ones. It's taking what's there, collecting them, like think, and then bulking them up into like trillions of them and then giving them really good food and then putting them back. And so it's, you're getting these exact, like, imagine, imagine for instance, like, uh, you know, take America, for instance, and you take the Native American people that have been just like, oh, just, just 
treated so poorly like go, go look up you want to you want to like start crying and, and realize what what went wrong go look up the california genocide and start looking at the trail of tears and look at what happened in the 18 uh 1830s uh in in 1860s and and all the way uh it's just like oh man uh, 1849, the California gold rush brought all these people and they annihilated the lo the, the indigenous people. And it's just like, they would just kill them. It's like, that's crazy, man. That's a human being. Um, so, and I mean, speaking as we're at war, right? It's like, oh my gosh. But the, the thing is they knew how to live off the land, right? The natives. So, so imagine you take the natives and you and you give them just the most resources. So instead of subjugating them to the worst land and providing drugs and alcohol and depressing them and multi generational trauma, you actually take these folks and big them up and tell them, look, you guys can be the leaders here. You guys have the indigenous knowledge. You guys are some of the best people on earth. You're more in touch with spirit. You're more in touch with nature. You're more in touch with your your actual natural surroundings. You know, and you and you create this mind idea that they're powerful, right? And they are, right? And and then feed them and give them just the most resources instead of like giving money to banks or big oil or subsidizing uh, monocrop uh, corn. You actually give the money back to the natives, and and give them the ability to like replenish the salmon, reforest the nations, you know, uh, bring the wildlife back into balance, plant more oak trees, you know, like bring that bring it back to like the permaculture stuff which i kind of do romanticize and idealize it I'm not saying that you know it's whatever but but the, giving the resources to the indigenous folks versus the industry the military the the killing like give the resources to the peaceful people the ones that are gonna like love and build and, and nourish children and put children on the land and reconnect you know the next generations thinking seven generations ahead give them the resources, I'm pretty sure the land would recover. I'm pretty sure, you know, we wouldn't have Costco and all these things where we just live like and we drive, zoom around in cars and go a thousand miles an hour. We have to walk some places, but the land would recover. Our health would return, the microbes, the soil, all these things. Um, you know, and I'm not saying like get rid of that, all that stuff. I'm saying just like put, shift the resources towards land care, shift the resources towards people that are doing this stuff. And they will build a great soil environment. So that analogy of giving the resources to your native people, bulking them up, then they will build a better soil environment and it will come. You know, imagine there's thousands of them and they're you're, you're bred, you know, not bred like this, this uh, kind of like a eugenics type of term, but like they're enabled, they're empowered to thrive instead of being suppressed and oppressed and um, you know, like Hawaii, man, we get, we get all this spam shipped in and like all this stuff. And it's like, you know, locally, we don't even value Kalo in, in the land. It's so hard to obtain, you know, based on like, you know, to do agriculture, it's like, man, you just sell out to development. It's like, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent here. Really what I want to focus on is microbes and not these, um, things here. And everyone kind of understands that. Um, and Partita which she's been just amazing in the comments here is talking about, you know, there's distinct differences between local microbes and, um, yeah. So yeah. And, and yeah, the, the local ones are designed for extreme stress unless they're oppressed by like guns and ammo and, you know, systematic extinction and genocides. Right. Um, but we kind of do that, do that with conventional farming and the tilling and stuff. So characteristics again, um, and I think this is what Partita is getting into. They have the ability to decompose organic compounds. So how are they getting their food? How are they powering themselves up? Well, in a natural functioning system, they're making it richer and leaf matter is falling. Um, animals are dying. Birds are pooping. Insects are putting frass, chitin, you know, all, all, all this whole system is functioning. And the microbes have the ability to, to decompose it and turn it back into uh, nutrients that are available for uptake again. Um, they also, it says ca catalyst, cal uh, 
I don't know, catalysis. It's so it's kind of weird. Maybe that is the way you spell it. Catalyst of chemical processes in the soil. So the microbes, if you're not familiar with enzymes, that's really an interesting thing to look up. Suze is reading about um, the GAPS diet. My wife Suze is reading, you know, um, which stands for, I don't know. It's not, I, I shouldn't say things that I don't know. Um, but these enzymes are super important and the microbes secrete these, which then accelerates and, and helps the chemical processes and breakdown. Enzymes are kind of the drivers. And this is something that I was listening to a, um, a higher side chats with this guy on water the other day, and he was talking about enzymes. It's really a, 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 um, a thing I want to get into and look up more. What are enzymes? Because zyme is like uh, life, right? Um, like like Bechamp had these things called zymates, which were these cores of life that then build these outer shells and, and zyme. Like so enzymes where it's like, I don't know, I, I really need to look and research more on enzymes, but they do, um, they're, they're non-break, they don't break down and they help catalyze chemical processes. So um, cool. And Partita knows about these enzyme in the database, and I would love to learn more about enzymes. I got, I got to, maybe I should get some books on that and dive deep into that. Um, and they help facilitate recovery, right? The indigenous microbes help to recover the, 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 the land, right? And when we showed that prior, right, where they make airspace, they make water, they help roots grow, they help carbon be stored, they help uh, mitigate erosion, they help oxidize the soil, all these things. So the natural ecosystem recovers from the indigenous microbes. Not to say there's not other microbes that'll help with that, but these ones are the sustainable over the long term in balance. And the suppression of disease, which again, we were talking about earlier, the black spots on the figs, by circulating naturally active materials. So the the um, and, you know, the microbes reach out and bring nutrients around. And if there's too much in an area, they'll spread it out and put it into these carbon stores like a bank, right? And so the microbes naturally suppress disease by giving the nutrition that the plants want. And Jut Kabi says they're, it's, it's dollar free. It's pretty much free to do this. If you follow the, the JMS recipe, which is disgustingly cheap microbes, or it's pretty inexpensive to use a substrate, especially if you're farming and you have your own and you have like a chipper shredder or you have a way or you have a machete and a lot of time, um, you know, there's all these ways to get it. And so it's very low cost as well, right? You don't have to have some fancy lab and sterile environment, all these things that you just, you just naturally grab what's there, feed them, put them back out. Like it's pretty simple, it's simple, like makes total sense on it. Like, I teach this to elementary school kids and they're like, yeah, of course, mister. What are we learning about today? And it's like, no, you don't understand. The adults don't understand this concept. And they're like, but it's obvious, mister. And it's like, well, you know, at least you guys know now because you guys are going to turn to adults and the adults are all kinds of confused. They're like, we need to save the world, build a big machine, spend a bunch of money. Uh, I don't know. But the kids are like, yeah, you take what's there, you make it better and you put it back. They're like, yeah, that makes sense, mister. It's like, yeah, what are we missing on the large scale? What are what are the, you know, if anyone can, uh, you know, get in touch with Bill Gates and, and send him over here for a week, I'd love to, probably might, yeah, anyway, I got to let go of the anger of what what I feel like he's done to us and bring out the the teaching this guy. And, and first off, the other thing is just demonetize those guys. Stop participating in their system. It's fake money. Um, and they, they're just choking everyone. So anyway, a lot of other things on the, on the topic today, but, um, let's stick back to the microbes and go to collecting IMO. Stay on the presentation. That's good. Focus. Let go of the conflict, right? Let it go. Peace, equanimity, stick to balance the words of the sage, you know? Yeah. So collecting IMO and the time of collection, IMO be, can be collected at any time. What's the best time to collect IMO? Right now. No, there's a few times you don't want to collect. Um, those are um, when it's really, really rainy. And um, also if it's super, super dry. Um, but but either, either of those times, you know, if that's your natural climate, go for it. Collect it. 
because if that's naturally happening all the time, you can do it, right? So should you collect in winter? Yes. Should you collect in summer? Yes. Should you collect in spring? Yes. Should you collect in fall? Yes. Should you collect anytime, all the time? Probably, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> teach gates or compost them. Yeah, you know, either way. But peace, man, peace. Um, yes, yes. And also the other benefit of IMOs is when you're making them, you can bury yourself in a pile and get all this healing happening. And that's that's really where it's at, right? Get get all this happening. So the period of collection, again, it, it, this is what he means. It means like how long should you leave your IMO box out? And in the spring and fall, he says seven to 10 days. In the summer, it's four to five days. So for me here, um, I always feel like, you know, it's about five days for me here in Hawaii. You know, this can actually go, if you're going to do it in winter, make this like 14 to 20 days, you know, uh, it takes a long time and winter is really not the best time to collect, but you can, um, it's best to like insulate it really, really well. And, but it's best to do, you know, spring, fall, summer, but the time of collection changes because the temperature changes and the variable of the microbes growing faster or slower changes, right? So be aware of that. Um, and he talks about the place of collection, like where should you collect um, arable fields and the closest field that is slightly higher than, what does he say here? Oh, can I not slide that up? It's not at the actual text box. No, it's not. Oh, look at that nice hand though. I like that. Yeah, it's like Mickey Mouse's glove. Um, oh yeah, cool. Um, I don't know why it's a glove now. But um, anyway, yeah, the high, you know, slight, slightly higher than your elevation. There's the, the text is hidden behind. Apparently, this is just a um, image of a image. Um, but you know, go go to a, a you know a nice forest in your fields, fields that are slightly you know. But you're wanting to get the IMOs that are in your fields, bamboo that's near you by, banana that's nearby. Um, forests, any of those things. Um, yeah. Don't forget we live like soil microbes in a multi-trophic, multi-directional complex system. Layer one can end the day on layer five. Yeah. So I think, I think there is infinite hope and in that not letting the, the globalists get us down, but becoming the globalists, becoming the fed being those guys, right? Um, yeah, and avoid herbicides if you can, or if you want to get herbicide tolerant ones, mix those in with, you know, the best thing to do is get multiple collections from multiple areas as close to you and as rich in a nearby area as you can, right? So materials for collecting a lunchbox, of course, because you're going to feed them, which is, you know, just a square rectangular box made out of natural materials such as Japanese cedar or bamboo, or in our case, that woven lauhala coconut basket, some type of thing here. Um, so the lunchbox type of thing, it's just a little small box. It's meaning that you're not getting a huge thing, like how big would you fit your lunch in, you know? It's, you don't, you just need a reasonable size, like a foot by a foot is like, you know, enough. You don't want to go like three feet and make this huge collection box. You really want a small like lunchbox size is really what it's meaning here. Um, low, low moisture rice, and um, you can use any starch, but low moisture rice is one of the best. So hard cook it, meaning that when I cook rice, I take a, like, you know, this much rice, that much water, you know, about th three quarters of, of the amount of water, and put that in and hard cook it. And I use an instant pot to do it, but you could cook it on a stove any way you cook rice to do it. And that will give you kind of slightly dry on the inside, but wet on the outside. And that's important because too much moisture will make it go anaerobic and you're trying to collect aerobic good soil microbes. So be careful on that. Then they're using white paper. Of course, it has to be white. Um, no, it doesn't. It, I, in fact, you can use like a t-shirt or something but um, some sort of, or paper towels, something to cover the top of your collection box, right? And that seals in the gases so that they can do quorum sensing. And so, and then they use a rubber band or rice straw to put over the top. Um, 
And if you look, if you're really interested in this process and you haven't been, um, you know, tuned in that much, um, going to YouTube or in fact, click on my channel here. So I'm just going to shortcut to my channel. No, view it on YouTube. No, I maximize it. My mouse is too big. It's all, why did I do that? I wanted to just go here and you click down here on my name, go to the channel. And then it turns out they move this way over here, this search thing and search for IMO. But, oh, is it even? It's not even there. Oh, this one, this one right here, how to collect IMO indoor. So this one, you want to really see how it's being done. Uh, this video right here, how to collect IMO indoor is really uh, a great one because it shows how we're bearing it in here and how we're moistening it. And you could do the same thing outdoors, but you'll see that when we place the rice, like here's the rice being placed. And then right towards the end, here's the box being put in there, right? And this one, we put the cover on and then this other one. Um, so there's the cover being put on that one. And then the other one, look, there's sticks being put across it to, to make it go. These sticks are put to keep the paper out and then sure enough, right after that, after the sticks are put on to keep the, the paper from falling down onto the rice, then the paper is put over, right? And the paper just gives it that lid so that it, it stays solid. And this is how to do it here. And then, um, and then here there's rice straw and that's put on either side. Um, and the reason for that is there's a lot of bacillus subtilis, different microbes in the rice straw, and it sort of helps it go. So that, and then, then after that, of course, it is buried over and we bury it and put it way underneath. So that's like, you know, how to collect. This is a video of how to do it. Um, you know, great time with Master Lee teaching us how to do this. So glad for Ray and, and um, his organization to make that happen there it teach us all this because, you know, when you see this rice straw here, I would have been confused why, but that's exactly how. So, um, and then a container box. So if you're not doing it indoors, put a cage or something above it, but not so you're keeping it off the floor and, um, mark the location so you don't lose this thing buried in the ground. Right. Um, so, so some sort of cage to put over it. Um, if, if you're doing it outdoors, so that's collecting IMO, seeing the video, it's, uh, you know, you get it there. Um, do I have a video on liquid IMO? Uh, I should make one on liquid IMO. In fact, I do have videos on it. Um, Post Up Media is helping me work through a bunch of the videos. I do have them. Are they out? Are they published? No. I've been sitting on it for like a couple, couple weeks here. So a couple, almost a year now of the footage that we shot last November. Um, but anyway, oh lot to do and also sometimes I lose my um, like the ability to want to sit at this office and slam out a bunch of um, Premiere Pro and do video editing I'm just like nah. sometimes it doesn't seem like it's that important in my life to be honest I feel like other things take precedence even though it does make a lot of difference for you guys but I already know it and so like oh, I gotta share this like oh man come on anyway so the collection site, um, you know, where, where to collect. So this is going a little bit back on this one here where it says place of collection here from that slide. Um, you know, putting it near bamboo, they have sweetness in the roots. And there's also a lot of, um, lot of broadleaf leaf litter growing up. That's where he recommends to put it, you know. So bananas also put a lot of exudates out of their roots. That's why they're a good choice. Bamboos. Um, you know, things like mango trees, avocados, um, but if you're not in the tropics, which, you know, I always talk about solutions for the tropics, look for something with broad leaves, you know, don't use things with pine needles. You, you can, but, um, it's better to put it around broad leaf things. Um, and then he also recommends putting on a rice stumps. So once after you cut the rice, they're going to exude a whole bunch of, uh, sugars and if you put the micro your box out on a rice stump field you'll get a really good collection as well um and it's it well and here's here's the thing too this here here's one point that contradicts something i say all the time 
it's better to collect in a slightly barren area rather than a nutrient rich area. That's something, you know, I always say make multiple collections, do it in your field, but also do it in a rich area. But right here, he's contradicting me and, and, and he's correct, right? So we're in conflict. So I got to find peace and equanimity back to this. But here it is right here. It's better to collect in a slightly barren area rather than a nutrient rich area. So everyone who's saying, oh, my area is not that great. Should I drive thousands of miles to go to a forest or hundreds or 20 miles or I don't, I don't I want to um, support you know, like, but right in your barren areas where you should do it apparently here. And I do recommend going to a good area as well, but you got IMOs around you. Use what's at your feet and use these things. Um, and Brandon's asking here, slightly off topic question of, can you use IMO2 for JMS? You can, but it's actually better to use just dirt. It's better to use dirt. So you can, but it's better not to. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. And you guys are talking about nutrients in these things. Um, okay. And I don't recommend using OHN in your rice when you cook it. Although we'll go through this presentation and see if he recommends it here. Um, you know, here, here's the thing, your steamed rice, you put the cover over, you bury it deep. Notice it's deeply buried, right? That's what he's trying to show here. Deeply buried. So it's touching the soil beneath even, and then covering it with a plastic sheet to prevent rain. And then, you know, after two days in a hot area, which I still find it's five days here in Hawaii. I mean, it's not like hundred degrees, but it's, it's pretty darn, you know, it's hot. Um, 10 days in a cool area. Look, the white mold surface looks wet. Exactly. That's how you get the IMO one. Notice he didn't put any, or he, he actually did put um, fermented plant juice in there when he was doing the steamed rice. So this is from the forest here. So this is very similar to the recipe I just showed on the video where, you know, taking the leaf mold from the forest, making sure it's a, a liquid, you know, moist enough, then putting in a bucket here, like just similar to what I was showing in the video, and then cooking the rice with a little bit of fermented plant juice or can of food put in there at a uh, one to thousand dilution. It actually looks like a one to a hundred. One, no, it's one to a thousand. Yeah. Dilution here um, with this steamed rice um, and then leave it for, a you know, leave it a day. Although I think it's more than one day. Um, and then here's an example of doing the, um, the rice harvesting. And it looks like he's putting his box upside down. I don't know. I don't think that's exactly, oh, oh, put the box face down on the rice after harvesting. Yeah. So he was putting it face down. That was wild. So hopefully your rice is really packed in there to stay in there. I don't know how you'd want to have it. And you got to keep wires to keep the rats out because the rats love that race. Rats love destroying everything good. Um, so anyway, going through, I'm going to kind of speed up because I'm getting towards the end of the office hour here. And um, yeah, so and then here, you know, them just going out to their good forest, of course, have a good friend with you. Really uh, appreciate Julia's videos. She's been documenting this, so check out Julia's channel. She's in the chat. It's Julia, and check out her channel. She's been doing a whole bunch. Um, here's you know here's the thing. They're putting this over, putting a rubber band on it. But again, you saw the other one with the sticks. Uh, and here's you know they're they're collecting the IMO, bringing all this leaf litter. Notice it's not just leaf litter; it's also soil. So don't just get the leaves; also get the soil bring that back, set it up, put your little basket over it, you know, bury it. No, you know, it goes this way. So bury it under your things with your soil and then put this here. Um, and then let's see here. So IMO one is aerobic microorganisms. Of course, that's why you want it to be lots of airspace. The color should be white. So in the smell of yeast floating, which, Ooh, what does that smell? Oh, it's yeast floating. No, it's, it should smell, you know, kind of yeasty a little bit, um, and and it should be warm. If you're, you know, if you reach under your box and it's cold, it should be a little warm, especially if it's a thin box. If it's a thick wood box, I don't know if you're going to feel the warmth. 
Um, and they should be predominantly white, like 80% white. If you've got tie-dye in all different types of colors, uh, you got too anaerobic, your rice was probably too wet, and those things. So this is what Master Cho's nice loafs look like. You know, look, there are some other colors, but it's predominantly this white, and when you flip it over, it's firm, it's not soggy, and it's 80% white here looking at it, just to see. That's showing that you got enough Bacillus subtilis growing and, and really doing well. So these are his, you know, what should it look like? This is what he gets. And, and you know, is my collection good? Well, does yours look nice like this? Um, and we'll end it right there on this because I'll go into the IMO2 starting next time and we'll go do a little bit review, get back on this. And um, sup, Thomas? Glad you're here late. Awesome, man. And... Um, you can always go back and watch these things. So there's the IMO one. There's all those things. You know, that's what a good collection should look like. Cotton ball, nice, rich. Um, but the other one that he shows that was a good collection here is this one. You know, and this is the La Hala basket coming back previously. But this is what you're looking for. These are the microbes you're looking for, right? Um, and so anyway, I um, want to thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, checking things out, being part of the KNF community globally, uh, making a big difference, even though it may seem like it's small. Again, you know, if you want to like, subscribe, whatever, click down below on the YouTube, check out the channel, go through, find things, research something, share it with me, tell me about it. Um, so I know that you're getting things. And again, you know, canfsupport.com. I'm going to update the website right after this. Um, and if you're interested in, you know, again, if you're in Hawaii, you want to win a ticket, purknf.org to come to the HFU convention. Check that out. Big shout out to the Pure KNF Foundation sponsoring this and doing all the, you know, web work and making it, making the movement move, collecting things. Looks like I got to update some of these questions too. Got to get to it before the goof, man. No, he, he actually, he's been really good at answering questions here. And I really appreciate um, the goof man for doing this. So, um, so yeah, again, do your best, uh, you know, minimize conflict with balance and all these things, equanimity. I want to appreciate y'all. So thanks. I'll see you next week, more November for us. Long live the natural farmer. Love you guys. Aloha. Bye now.